A singularly bleak and forlorn landscape. A desert in the middle of Austria. It's very quiet. Nothing but the croaks of grass frogs can be heard. Everything seems peaceful and harmonious, and yet, danger is at hand. In spring, digging begins in the gravel pits. Explosions and bulldozers rip holes in the landscape. The building industry uses 12 tons of stone, gravel and clay per capita, year in and year out. A mountain so huge, one could bury a small town beneath it. There seems to be no room for nature here. And yet, this is a story about a paradise. For some time soon, the bare ground and the steep slopes will become a unique and fascinating habitat. Pioneer plants burst through the gravel. They can only flourish on poor, stony ground. Now, islands of plants appear. The ground between them will remain bare for many years. This sparse vegetation, the desolate desert-like drifts and cliffs, make up a landscape that has a magical attraction for rare and endangered animals. Bee-eaters are usually the first to spot the new habitat from the air. They're coming back from their winter quarters in Africa. They've covered almost 5,000 kilometers in less than a week to come and brood here. Bee-eaters lay their eggs in holes they peck in the sandy walls, centimeter for centimeter, until they're a meter deep. They used to find banks like these along quiet stretches of river. Now, in many regions, disused quarries are the only places left for the colorful birds to breed in. The ground at the foot of the bank is pitted with strange little craters. Beneath them, dangerous footpads are lurking. Ant lions. They feel the slightest vibration in the sand. The ant lion clocked the potato beetle long ago, and should it slip into the crater, the ant lion's claws will make short work of it.
But the vibrations die away. The ant lion must keep his ear to the ground a while longer. Mother Fox also finds the quarry's peace and quiet very inviting. The cubs are only five weeks old. Nevertheless, the mother rarely stays home during the day. She often leaves the litter alone for hours on end. Gingerly, the cub comes closer. As soon as he begins to eat, the others follow suit. The smell of food soon emboldens the foxes. They turn their whole attention to the feast. And therefore, don't notice the sharp eyes watching them from a niche in the cliff. While the males eat, the female fox babies keep their distance, for there's a sibling hierarchy to be observed. which never lasts very long, of course, and today is no exception. The eagle owl has lost interest for the moment. She can't leave the nest right now. Her tiny newborn babies need her warmth. In spring, when evening falls in the quarries, Rare, shy, and mysterious animals sometimes appear. Stone curlews. They're looking for a nesting place. Only seven pairs of these wary birds are brooding in Austria at the moment. In the brooding season, one sees them during the day. Otherwise, they are nocturnal hunters who, with their peculiar cries, make the quarries an eerie place to be in. A little ringed plover has hatched very near. The young hatched only three days ago. For that, they're already moving quite independently and surely. The little ringed plover babies seem to do very well in the sparse vegetation, and in times of need, there's always a good hiding place at hand. The stone curlew feels quite at home in the quarry too. She's accepted it as a nesting place. Suddenly, the little ringed plover warns the second chick. The wind gets up and it's appreciably cooler. The stone curlew retires. Still nothing untoward shows itself in the quarry. Then dark clouds loom over the cliffs. The animals scurry into their holes. With the advent of rain, the only safe place in this bush and treeless place is underground. Young foxes, once they've tasted the joys of the outside world, are not easily sold on the delights of a cave anymore. 
But then again, there's nothing so warm as mummy's fur coat, after all. Those holes in the loose sand near the surface are in danger after the first few raindrops already. And it looks as though a heavy spring thunderstorm's on the way. While the rain drums on the sand, it's dry, safe, and cozy in the foxhole. When the storm goes grumbling on its way at last, and only moonlight floods the pit, strange things start to happen. As though at a secret signal, Natterjacks surface in the sand. The natterjacks flit across the ground like mice in the moonlight. With the last drop of rain, they shoot out to find the fresh grass-free puddles to lay their eggs in. In the distance, the first males are calling already. For the females, it's still a long way and not without dangers. The Natterjack's mousy movements have attracted a grass snake. It's too late to flee. There's only one hope. Keep cool. Recovering from the shock, Lady Natterjack makes for the puddle as quickly as possible. The calls Lord Natterjack makes with his huge sound bellows can be heard for miles. The volume is equal to that of a pneumatic drill. Only a few hours later, a little past midnight, the scare is over and the ladies head for home.
Long before it gets light, the Natterjacks snuggle back into the sand. Only when it's rained hard again will they once more flit over to the puddles and hatch so that their young will be fully developed before the puddles evaporate. That same night, the ant lions get busy too. The surface of the ground has hardly dried when they start fashioning their new crater traps. A real lion king rises to every challenge. The crater construction begins with a few rounds in one direction, then an S is described and dug down deep. The antlion then takes a seat at the very bottom of the crater and waits for pay dirt. If the digging is too much bother and their hunger too acute, however, the antlions will often go straight for the kill. Underground, the antlion stalks his unwitting prey. The antlion injects first a paralyzing shot, then digestive juices, before sucking his victim dry. In the twilight, the vixen leaves her lair. It has become too small for her and her lively cubs. She must seek a new home in the neighborhood. Instinctively, the cubs practice games that will help them survive in later life. Everything has to do with hunting, worrying and shaking the life out of, and biting to death. They practice burying food too, and defense against competitors. No holds are barred. In a pinch, they'll even sit on their prey. It's not only in sand and gravel that the animals burrow and build. The steep, solid walls of disused stone quarries will sometimes harbor whole colonies. Jackdaws are very sociable birds, the pair staying together all their lives. Jackdaws live in close-knit communes. They protect each other, beat off foes together, and it can happen that childless birds help mothers feed their young. The shadow in the door triggers a cry from the jackdaw baby, and the beak stays open in expectation of things to come. After dinner, they clear the table. The 
The rain has also filled the ponds in the pits. These now turn into playgrounds for dragonflies, frogs, and waterfowl. Secreted in the reeds, a resolute moorhen takes her children for a walk. An emperor dragonfly, one of the biggest and most colorful of all indigenous types, laying her eggs. She carefully pastes them on leaf stalks and grasses. The male of the species common blue damselfly rears up like an exotic plant. He's holding on tight to his girl and warding off rivals, for the competition among dragonflies is murderous. To thwart other suitors, some dragonfly types stay glued to their fiancées right down to the water where she lays her eggs. At the very last moment he lets go, and the mother-to-be goes the dangerous bit underwater alone. Meanwhile, the contenders chat up the next bevy of beauties. The mating season revives old feuds, not only among the dragonflies. For the otherwise peace-loving bee-eaters, the battle for the brides has also begun. Before the bride is prepared to mate, however, a complex ritual must be observed. The groom is required to make a catch, bring it to his designated bride, and then feed her. Some of the boys are none too familiar with this ritual, however. Even though the groom has come up with the wedding breakfast and the bride signaled her consent, he can still run into trouble. In spite of various obstacles, however, bee-eater babies continue to be born year in and year out, which for the adult birds means feed them. The parents will fly some 10,000 hunting sorties in the next four weeks. The bee-eater babies are blind and naked for one week. They orient themselves towards their parents' cries, but it sometimes takes a while to locate the food. At eight weeks, the fox cubs have long ventured forth from their hole. They explore every nook and cranny of the quarry. The cubs playfully undertake their first hunting expeditions and are confronted with something new at every turn. The little foxes watch the hedgehog quizzically. A third party is also following the scene with great interest.
Only now does the hedgehog notice the foxes. They are hardly bigger than he is, but still he takes to his heels. With which he unwittingly challenges the foxes. They are so fascinated by the hedgehog's smell and movements that they fail to notice the impending peril. Quills make little impression on an owl's strong claws, and so it often happens that during the brooding season, when the young owls need lots of food, the slow hedgehogs will fall foul of the deadly talons. The young owls grow fast, but it will still take some time for them to become independent. Birds born on the ground, instead of in a safe, inaccessible nest, must develop that much quicker. This little stone curlew hatched only yesterday, and he left his ground floor nest in the gravel just a few hours ago. Quietly, so as not to alert any enemies, the parents show him what's edible and what's not. For soon he will have to feed himself. While down below the little stone curlew pecks away daintily, upstairs in the nest they're gobbling greedily. After the meal, drowsiness overcomes the family. Gorged and content, the little owl's lids droop over his big eyes. He doesn't know just how tired he is. The warmer it gets, the more agile the grass snake becomes. At this time of year, its cup runneth over, especially in the pools and puddles. Dozens of frogs defend their reserve with loud honks and aggressive gestures. Thousands of tadpoles teem below the surface. Rich, easy prey for the snake. A spadefoot's tadpoles measure up to 10 centimeters. The tadpole tries to free itself by lashing out with its powerful tail. But the grass snake pulls it ashore and puts pay to any chance of escape.
The pit changes in summer. Some of the plants die. The pit begins to go brown. The warmer it gets, the more sand lizards flit back and forth through the dry grass. The bare ground gets warm very quickly and attracts many insects. This lizard is hunting. It has already marked its victim. The blue-winged wasteland grasshopper is a tricky proposition, though. Not only does it jump very high, it can fly for kilometers, too. In July, the sun sears the shadeless pits. The puddles and pools evaporate. The hot sand starts to fly off the walls. Most of the young toads were able to quit the puddles before they dried out. When most other animals retreat from the heat, wasps come into their own. They are masters of orientation. Digger wasps burrow small breeding pipes in the uniformly sandy floor. When one pipe is finished, the eggs are laid and the pipe is carefully sealed off. Then off the wasp goes, chicada hunting. Mother Wasp has noted each grain of sand so carefully that she immediately finds her hole in the desert again, opens it up and brings the chicada to her larvae. A sand wasp has captured a caterpillar and paralyzed it with a shot of poison. The wasp will drag the inert caterpillar anything up to 200 yards to the prepared cave. The caterpillars must reach a certain size and peeling stage before they make suitable food for the sand wasp's larvae. The sand wasp cases the joint once more and checks that the caterpillar is in the right position. Then it opens the well-camouflaged cave entrance with its strong jaws. The sand wasp lays a single egg on each caterpillar. The larva that hatches will first eat the non-vital parts of the caterpillar and kill it only at the very end of its development, thus ensuring that the feed stays fresh as long as possible. This minor tragedy is enacted beyond the outside world's field of vision. But the pits are not always idyllic settings. Above all, in the insect world, it often comes to dramatic scenes.
Some of the ant lions have bagged hardly any prey at all. They can go without food for up to six months, it's true, but sometime or other, they have to eat. Prospective game is prowling around the crater already, but first it must fall in. The hungry antlion jumps on its victim. It strikes over and over again. The antlion bombards the ant with sand, trying to make it topple. The ant finds no purchase on the sheer slope. An unusual sound in the sand. When the harvest's in progress, common hamsters will sometimes come to the pit. The young foxes are almost fully grown. Mother fox hasn't been seen in the pit for days, so the young fox goes hunting on its own. He's got a lot to learn though, for even experienced foxes give grown hamsters a wide berth. The hamster's grit unsettles the fox. He gives up. He'd rather go hungry. After four weeks and thousands of hunting flights, the bee eaters will soon have finished their brooding season. With a final immense effort, they once more fetch countless insects. The young are already sitting in the cave doorway, a sure sign that they'll soon take wing. Then the bee eaters will leave. Around this time, in midsummer, another remarkable night commences. The big-bellied, one-centimeter-tall ant lions have become slender ant lionesses, almost four centimeters high. The ant lioness is hardly hatched when she climbs up branches and grass blades, spreads her wings and dries them.
The delicate ant lioness now has very little in common with her ant lion larva phase. But suddenly, a strange confrontation comes about. As if in recall of her former life, the lioness launches an attack. But this time, the former lion loses the fight. The ant has bitten off a chunk of her leg and sprayed her with acid. An ant lioness's life is a short one. They mate, lay their eggs, and then pass away. Soft morning light heralds the decline of summer. The bee-eaters and stone curlews, together with their young, have all left the pits. The spadefoot toads bury themselves before it gets too cold. The Escalapian snake is looking for winter quarters as well. While others toil at their building sites, the snake utilizes already existent hideaways and moves into the bee-eater's cave. The toads and snakes will reduce their body functions to a few token breaths and heartbeats and spend the next months inert, deep in the earth. The bee eaters will continue to hunt in the fields for a while longer, then head for their winter quarters in Africa. In late summer, the young foxes, too, are casting around for a hunting ground of their own. For one of them, this means the first encounter with a strange and dangerous, yet enticing world. Beginning of October, the autumn spreads its cloak across the pits and quarries. It grows cold, for the low sun peeps but briefly over the cliffs and bathes them in a soft glow for just two or three hours. Now's the time for foxes to seek a winter hole. This young vixen has retired to a disused stone quarry. She casts around for a suitable hole. Foxes are good swimmers. Some cross rivers and streams every day. And so this pond is no obstacle for the vixen. And on the other side, beckon boundless prospective hiding places between stones and in fissures. The vixen feels safe in the pit. The first autumn storms seal off the young antlion's craters. They'll spend the next two or three years lying in wait here in the sand, and will survive, even if the frost turns the sand to stone. Life in the pits and quarries seems extinct, but only until one night late in January. 
In the stone quarry, a mature fox takes the scent of a young vixen. She watches him carefully. Agitated by her smell, the fox retraces each of her tracks. The fox's first pass is quite timid. Then he beats a retreat. But now the vixen's interest has been aroused. Over and over again she challenges him, teasing and egging him on, and then running away. Not yet fully grown, the young vixen pulls the strings in this nocturnal shadow game, this carousel which will continue to turn as long as there's life on Earth. And perhaps one of her cubs will visit the very cave where she herself grew up. The landscape is being ravaged, but even that can mean a new genesis, for the excavation will stop again sometime, and then they'll return. The stone curlews, antlions, wasps, bee-eaters, and all the others who need a bleak landscape, who no longer have anywhere else where they can survive. They will return as long as there are disused quarries, sand, gravel, and clay pits. They will return as long as these so-called scars are not patched up and made green, so long as the pits remain forgotten and undisturbed. And one leaves them to Mother Nature, who will soon again leave her own trails in the sand. bury a small town beneath it. There seems to be no room for nature here. And yet, this is a story about a paradise. For some time soon, the bare ground and the steep slopes will become a unique and fascinating habitat. Pioneer plants burst through the gravel. They can only flourish on poor, stony ground. Now, islands of plants appear. The ground between them will remain bare for many years. This sparse vegetation, the desolate desert-like drifts and cliffs, Make up a landscape that has a ma In spring, digging begins in the gravel pits.
Explosions and bulldozers rip holes in the landscape. The building industry uses 12 tons of stone, gravel and clay per capita, year in and year out. A mountain so huge, one can magical attraction for rare and endangered animals. Bee-eaters are usually the first to spot the new habitat from the air. They're coming back from their winter quarters in Africa. They've covered almost 5,000 kilometers in less than a week to come and brood here. Bee-eaters lay their eggs in holes they peck in the sandy walls. A singularly bleak and forlorn landscape. A desert in the middle of Austria. It's very quiet. Nothing but the croaks of grass frogs can be heard. Everything seems peaceful and harmonious, and yet danger is at hand. Centimeter for centimeter until they're a meter deep. They used to find banks like these along quiet stretches of river. Now, in many regions, disused quarries are the only places left for the colorful birds to breed in. The ground at the foot of the bank is pitted with strange little craters. Beneath them, dangerous footpads are lurking. Ant lions. They feel the slightest vibration in the 